when I was involved in the anti-apartheid movement, South Africa did not have a constitutional democracy. In fact, the majority of the people in South Africa did not have access to the vote. In the United States, we tend to do it two ways. Either the people enact a constitutional amendment, so you have, for example, the right of women to vote. That was by constitutional amendment. Or you have the basic premises of the Constitution as originally acted, the equality provision, um, the liberty provisions, and people who feel that their government is not treating them equally in some kind of way go to court to ask the judicial system to enforce those rights. Of course, legislative change really drives most of the change uh, in the United States. Uh, we have a wonderful Congress with elected representatives from all of the states. We are a huge democracy with millions of people living in a vast continent. And somehow we have made this constitutional democracy work. And I think you can go in any one of those directions. From time to time, of course, such as the civil rights movement in the South, each of those avenues seem to be blocked. And then you have um, the kind of social movement that might occur in countries that do not have a constitutional democracy, and that could be South Africa, uh, it could be um, Czechoslovakia, whatever it is. And that, of course, uh, was the, really what the thrust of the civil rights movement was. Although there had been amendments to the United States Constitution following the Civil War, <coughs> um, for black uh, citizens in the United States, they were still being denied the right to vote, uh, denied access to equal education. And so there was, in addition to the traditional legal, legislative, constitutional amendment avenues, people took to the streets in large numbers. And that really gave the civil rights movement in the United States a great thrust. Judges don't make social change. Judges decide cases. People bring cases to the court. So we don't decide we would like to do uh, this for African Americans or this for women. Uh, litigants, citizens, people, businesses have to bring the case. And what a judge does is look at the facts, look at the law, listen to the arguments on both sides, and then issue a decision that is consistent with precedent and that resolves the claim. Now, many people have suggested that the rather rapid escalation of the recognition of same-sex marriage since my decision in 2003 somehow is quite, quite rapid, quite fast. And I would say there are two ways to look at that. The first is the first legal claims for same-sex marriage were actually brought 40 or 50 years ago. People forget about that. And so it depends on whose shoes you are sitting. For people who had those relationships 40 or 50 years ago, they might say the last decade hasn't been rapid at all. It needed something to break that logjam, as it were. Or uh, you could, if you're sitting in the many states, the majority of states that don't recognize same-sex marriage, you might say the pace is very slow. Or you might look at what happened immediately after the decision of the Supreme Judicial Court in Massachusetts, and there was a series of rejections and that is not at all unusual. And it's particularly not unusual for decisions that are made by state courts. In the United States, we really have 51 separate related but separate legal systems. There are 50 constitutions, and there's a United States Constitution. And the history of our nation has been 
that an issue is raised often in a state court. Federal courts have limited jurisdiction, not state courts. It's often raised first in the state court, and if a state court uh, enacts or decides in favor, in this case of same-sex marriage, it might sometimes other states follow suit, sometimes they don't, and then the decision just dies on the vine. But you can look back uh, really over the past couple of hundred years and see that happening constantly. When you are a judge, you decide the case. You cannot think about what the impact of that will be, if any. You cannot um, anticipate what the political arguments pro and against are. All a judge is doing is deciding the particular claims in that case. Uh, for example, if you have two parties and one says, the property line is A, and the other one says the property line is B. A judge decides whether the property line is A or B. The judge cannot say, why don't you two people get together, or how about you just split the baby? King Solomon might have done that, or thought he was doing that. But we don't do that. And so there's a whole other a uh, system that operates, mediation, arbitration, um, alternative dispute resolution, but that's not a way our judicial system. Ours is an adversary system. The parties cannot agree, and the judge has to decide which party is correct. So in the same-sex marriage case, we listen very carefully to the arguments raised by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts not by Iowa or California or anybody else or the Immigration Service, just by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and by the seven couples who were the plaintiffs in that case. And you don't think, well, what about all the other people and is this young people or old people? It's just those seven people. Whether we are in a special time for social change. That is to say, has the pace of change been quicker from the time I graduated from Yale Law School in 1976, or even from the time uh, I was at college in South Africa in the mid-1960s, is an interesting question. I would say this. First, in the United States, there's no question that with respect to civil rights, human rights. Um, the 20th century was a much more turbulent time. The society generally was changing. Communication was more rapid. People knew what was happening. It was not as um, stable a society. And I think, I'm not a an his social historian, but I think you could look and say there have been between the gender revolution beginning with the right to vote and the civil rights revolution and the disability revolution, people with disabilities and language revolutions. And even as I say that, I can hear the historian saying, I say, what are we talking about? We had a civil war. I mean, slavery was, you know, the hardest issue in the 19th century. Uh, the gender revolution didn't get underway with the fight for the right to vote. I mean, that was part and parcel of the 19th century revolution. People with disabilities, I don't know enough about it, but it seems to have grown um, more in the 20th century. Um, and certainly, um, sexual orientation has changed. So that's in the United States. 